before um, we have our speaker, our presenters today um, begin, I'd like to give an introduction of them. Those of you who um, may be meeting them for the first time today. Let me just pull up to my screen. Okay, born in British Columbia, Canada, um, Brother John has lived, traveled, and worked from South America to the North Pole, from Nepal to Nova Scotia. And he is trained as a lifestyle counselor, teaches public health programs, vegetarian cooking schools, and home remedy workshops. He is a carpenter by trade and has operated a family care home and an organic market garden. And he's volunteered in overseas domestic work in um, countries such as Guatemala, Belize, Puerto Rico, Nepal, and the Republic of Kiribati. You have to tell us about the Republic of Kiribati, <laughs> Brother John. In 2005, he published his award-winning book, Charcoal Remedies, the complete handbook of medicinal charcoal. Um, that will also, you can also find that at our local book and Bible house. And this success um, launched Brother John and his wife, Kimberly, into their internet business, charcoalhouse.com, which offers the widest selection of activated charcoal anywhere. Brother John continues to travel across America and internationally, giving seminars on the medicinal applications of activated charcoal for from ancient times right down to the 21st century. Brother John and his wife, Kimberly, reside in northwestern Nebraska. And you can find um, charcoalhouse.com online along with their internet ministry, charcoalremedies.com. And we will put that in the chat for you um, during our program today. So thank you so much, Brother John and Sister Kimberly. You may begin whenever you are ready. Well, we are ready. Um... Can I share my screen? Your screen is showing right now. It's just not in presentation. Okay, um, we, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, we do travel. We've uh, been doing health programs for a number of years. And the thrust of our program is that you are the gatekeeper of your health. And you decide. We want people to become informed so they can make good decisions about their health or maybe in their community, their family, their work associates, whatever. And part of that program is charcoal, medicinal charcoal, God's humble doctor. And it is truly amazing. Uh, I'm always reminded through the stories that she gets when she's working with um, customers on the phone. But just this last week, um, we've been doing a lot of building on our new warehouse and store. And I've gotten slivers from the lumber in my hands and two of them became really infected and uh, so one night I was complaining and she quickly responded got out some charcoal paste cream and uh, put it on my finger smeared it on put it put some uh, plastic over that and slid it into a, a glove and we didn't notice that much difference the next day but we did it again for a few more evening and then Thursday when I was over at work, I happened to touch that area with my um, my other finger, and I felt a little prick down there. And I looked down there, and I was so surprised. 
that right in this area where the sliver had gone on, gone in, it was all swollen and inflamed and very, very painful. <laughs> Here was this little sliver starting to come out of my, out of this area. And I just showed everybody because I was totally amazed. Um, we've had, we have stories of people uh, pulling glass, broken glass out of their skin, thorns and broken bones. And, uh, but this was the first time I actually saw it for myself. And it, it wasn't a big sliver, it wasn't anything heroic, but the fact was That's that sad. it pulled it out. And, you know, two days later, uh, there's virtually no swelling and there's no pain. And I didn't think it was gonna come through because of all the callus. And then I have, uh, I've had two root canals and every once in a while they get a little sore and I'll put, take a couple of charcoal tablets and put them on either side and tuck them in back into where my cheek area is uh, before I go to bed. And in the morning, the pain is gone. This happens, I've been doing this for years and years and years. I don't do it every night, but when I start to feel them start getting tender, I'll put them in there and uh, it works. The charcoal really does work. Now, Kimberly, do you have something off the top of your head from one of the customers recently that may have um, triggered a, a memory? Um, I can't think of anything specifically, but um, I always like to encourage people to use charcoal for their eyes. We're on the computers all the time, and we have the most amazing stories of how charcoal has helped people with rare eye diseases, such as parasplenitis, ocular inflammatory disorder, where a young woman was going blind and was turned around with charcoal, to people with glaucoma, macular degeneration. Um, for me, um, uh, my eyes have just been so wiped out uh, um, lately and uh, for personal reasons. And then um, using the computer and getting the charcoal, just putting hot charcoal poultices over the eyes. It is so, so amazing. We had a doctor, it was recently, she bought um, one of our um, iPads, but you can make your own. Um, no, she no. She's not talking about a, a Mac uh, device. She's right, talking right. about a right. an iPad that goes over your eyes. Okay. Yeah, so just like a poultice, and uh, she bought it for her daughter who had this new job who was just in front of the computer for a solid eight hours, and um, her daughter um, wrote the most amazing testimony to her mother, the doctor who shared it with us, just that she said, I had no idea how sore my eyes were until I started using this and how relieved they were. So um, that's just really amazing for, uh, you know, using charcoal for your eyes. Well, we, uh, we want to make sure from the beginning, some housekeeping here is medicinal charcoal is not burnt toast. Uh, I'm not saying that when grandma said burnt toast will work, for this or that, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it's medicinal charcoal, it's not burnt toast, it's not charcoal briquettes, and it's not a cure-all. In fact, we, we go so far as to say that we don't believe charcoal cures anything. Uh, what charcoal does, its claim to fame is that it absorbs poisons. And then the body is better able to heal itself the way the creator designed it to. So really charcoal is just uh, removing the poison and then the body takes over uh, and all the wonderful physiology that God has built into us and prayer and the healing takes place. Now, um, we mentioned that we travel a lot. Uh, here is our friend in prison. This is uh, an African country and she's in prison uh, visiting. And this is Sam on the left and he is an inmate and he's suffering terribly. Uh, she said he had sore throat, holes in his tongues. Uh, he had chest problems. Uh, he was very, very sick. And they came in to teach literacy um, to the inmates. Uh, this was in a uh, Northern country where there was a lot of uh, refugees coming back and a lot of them didn't know how to read or write. And so their program was teaching people to read and write using the Bible. And uh, this, this man is in prison for whatever and he has health issues. Now, Carolyn, we met Carolyn online and then she invited us to her Methodist church to put on a health emphasis weekend at her church. And from that, she learned how to use charcoal a lot and went back to Africa and used it there. Uh, they use charcoal to, uh, as a drawing card to their evangelistic programs. Uh, 
um, because there was a lot of sick people. So they would use charcoal demonstrations. Well, through all that, the literacy and the programs, they were invited into the prisons to teach literacy. And while they were doing that, they also started instructing the prisoners how to make and to use charcoal as a medicinal. Um, and she sent us, uh, we have hundreds of her stories, not just from the prisons, but um, there are different ministries that they use it. And this man had, was so sick, she gave him some charcoal to use and he it reported in two or three days, he was feeling so much better. His eyes were clearing up and uh, the holes in his tongue were healing over. And all the other inmates started asking him, so what are you doing? What are you doing? And he was a little bit nervous about sharing that he was using charcoal because he only had a limited supply. And, uh, but this man with his very limited supply of charcoal that he knew at that time, started freely sharing what he had freely received. And uh, that prison had 700 people in it, 700 men, and besides guards, and um, they were invited to other prisons. And here's another prison, 900 man prison. And uh, this man with the stick in his hand and a large mortar and pestle is pounding his own charcoal to make powder. And we were told that it was either a few hours or a few days before that, he, along with six other men, were in the men's latrine, in a latrine in Africa. You can imagine the, the sanitation there. And the guards had said he won't last a few more days. He'll be dead, along with maybe the others as well. He was so sick with dysentery, which is number two cause of death in this particular country. And so here he is, revived enough, and he's the one pounding the charcoal, and all the men mates are curious what he's doing. In one, that whole prison uh, was infected with dysentery, a 900 man prison. The guards had dysentery, and the warden had dysentery. And in one week, just one week of using homemade charcoal, not activated charcoal, just regular charcoal, the whole prison was free of dysentery. Not only that, uh, we provide the charcoal for them, they make their own charcoal powder. And they've, this Carolyn and her husband have been invited to go to other prisons. In fact, the, uh, the, the uh, secretary of prisons for that country gave them the, the uh, honorary keys to all the prisons in that country to come and teach literacy and how to teach uh, natural methods of healing. Uh, it's, it caught on and it would become a great uh, remedy. Here's another country in Africa. We have some Bible workers there. And this is a bed source on his upper back. Just a, it's, This is his spine right here uh, coming down from the hands. It's a huge bed sore. This is an eight months bed sore on day one. Uh, they applied a very, very large charcoal poultice over it. Here is day three, and you can see this white ring around the edge of the bed sore. That's new tissue in three days, just three days. And here is day 11. It's already beginning to grow in from the outside uh, and pushes off any charcoal that may be left on the wound. And there on the leg uh, by the hand, the left hand, you'll see another wound that's co still covered in charcoal. Now, what are we talking about? In these pictures so far, we're just talking about plain charcoal, the same thing that's left over after your campfire and you've had your sing song and you've told stories and the fire, everybody's gone to bed and the fire has gone out and in the morning you have charcoal. That's what we're talking about. Now, why on earth would anybody want to use charcoal? Well, on the other hand, drugs have side effects, as we all know. Uh, they become more and more addictive, and they become more and more resistant to disease. So these are all sad uh, effects of drugs, whereas charcoal <clears throat> has no negative known side effects. And yet it's reported by the FDA as safe and effective category one, no known adverse side effects. But we live in a world that has calamities, and these calamities can be anything from tsunamis and earthquakes and pandemics and wars and tornadoes and so forth. 
And, but along with them comes bad sanitation, water contamination, power failure, and so forth, spread of disease and lack of medical care. And oftentimes, even when it was Katrina in Louisiana, nobody got in, nobody got out, and you all you had was what you had for treating disease and so forth. Now here's an example of a calamity. This is Fukushima power plant, the nuclear power plant that had a meltdown in Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. Uh, down in the lower part of the picture, you'll see uh, this vented uh, building. It has anywhere from eight to 10 tons of activated charcoal, not just any activated charcoal, it's coconut charcoal. And that scrubber cleans the air from this nuclear power plant before it goes up those large towers out into the atmosphere for everybody to breathe. Now, when this happened, we noticed, uh, in, because our business is charcoal, we order charcoal from all over the world in large containers. And we saw our wholesale prices dramatically increasing. And so we contacted the manufacturer and say, what's going on with these prices increases? He said, well, the Japanese government is buying up all the coconut activated charcoal on the market uh, to uh, decontaminate the site. I, I did some more research and I found out that these reactors uh, have this all this coconut activated charcoal to clean radioactive material out of the air. And lo and behold, the number one antidote for radioactive poisoning is, guess what? Coconut activated charcoal. And uh, we never would have known it unless we had noted that nobody was advertising charcoal at any time during this whole catastrophe. And yet, lo and behold, uh, the Japanese government knew that it was the antidote and was buying up all this charcoal on the market, driving up prices. Um, one of the inspirations for writing our book was Dr. Agatha Thrash. She was the former medical examiner for the state of Georgia. And she uh, wrote this story about her daughter who, granddaughter who had, was bitten <coughs> by um, fire ants. Instantly, hundreds of ants began biting her. She had been playing around on an ant hill. She screamed hysterically from the intense pain. We grabbed her, stripped off her clothing, and ran for a bathtub. As it filled with water, I added charcoal. After being submerged in the charcoal bath for less than two minutes, she stopped crying. And then she writes, um, the charcoal neutralized the poison and her pain was gone. Charcoal has amazing healing properties. In fact, if I were stranded on a desert island, could take only one thing along to protect me from disease, infection, and injury, I would choose charcoal. Well, uh, back in, was it 2000? 2000 or 2001, I can't remember, I was working on the, the island nation of Kiribati out in the middle of the Pacific. And um, I got a terrible leg infection. I got flesh eating disease and it literally ate holes out of my leg uh, almost before my eyes. It started in my feet and started traveling up my leg. And I made peace with God one night. I knew I was not gonna see the morning, I was so sick. And out of the blue, decided to start using charcoal. And I packed my wound with charcoal. Um, and instantly, it started healing. It did absolutely nothing for the pain. I had pain for weeks with this, these open wounds on my leg. But eventually, they all healed over. I got down to where I could see ligament tissue. Uh, I would pull the dead flesh out with my, uh, my pliers, my sog pliers, Leatherman pliers. Um, the pain was intense, but the healing began within 24 hours. It was absolutely amazing. The fever, my high raging fever left, and I was able to continue on and heal. And uh, so that's in the book, Charcoal Remedies. We live out in, as you said, Northwest Nebraska. Here's our first uh, store and warehouse. We now have another warehouse, which is being added onto. And we live out in the country. We have high-speed internet, but we also have Pony Express. This is our neighbor's vet. <clears throat> Sent one of her helpers down to get some charcoal. And our neighbor has become a great enthusiast of charcoal. And Kimberly's going to tell a few stories of animal stories from now on. Here's a horse story that was called in, and she answered the phone. 
Yeah, this was a horse that was, they know that it was bitten by a brown recluse because they had been watching um, in the barn. This horse was their baby and he was about a year old or so. And uh, they called frantically because they were, um, first they had seen that this spot, so they shaved it because they had seen brown recluse in the barn. And uh, sure enough, it broke open. They did have a vet working with him and uh, she was using colloidal silver and then of course gave antibiotics and it was not working. And so she called and we overnighted some vet detox and I said to take that internally and also to apply it topically to the horse and um, just pack it in there. And this is what it's looking like. And as um, soon as they, <clears throat> excuse me, started getting the charcoal on, things started to improve immediately. And so this might look a little gross on day 12 to you, but actually that looks very good for a wound that's healing. And it just kept going on. And what really surprised them, they just, and so they obviously, they were not able to make a poultice. We did have a horse one time that was hit by a truck. They made poultices, but these guys, they just put it on. And what they were absolutely shocked by was you can see on day 24, to have even the hair growing back. And now it's nothing, they can't see anything. And one time when we were at some, I can't remember the name, when we were in Michigan, but anyway, some big program for children and such. And a veterinarian came by and saw these um, pictures and he got, he was amazed. He said, because horses are notorious for not healing well. And so then going on, this is Barney, um, how, how our vet became so uh, um, impressed with charcoal was she was a hard sell. She's our neighbor. And uh, one day she had um, her horse that was um, bit by a snake, a, a rattler around here, and just was getting extremely ill and the anti-venom wasn't working. And so she came up and says, okay, tell me about charcoal. What do I do? And so I said, okay, you've got to get some in him internally and he was bit right around the nose area. And I said, just cover his whole entire head because she has been waiting a long time doing this, waiting for the anti-venom to work. And it was really nice because she did exactly what we told her to do, which a lot of times doesn't happen. And so she gave it to him internally. She covered the whole face and he improved dramatically. She had two more clients that had snake bites. She said, please, can I just use charcoal because I am so convinced that the anti-venom didn't work on my horse. And they said, yes. And they just the charcoal worked beautifully. So here's Barney. And um, we have been out walking and she had told us about this dog. And she says, he's not getting any better. What had happened is this, he had gotten into a um, scuffle with another dog and the neighbor shot Barney and it kind of blew through his ear at the top but it didn't hit his brain. And so they brought him in, she patched him up, he went home, and then he broke out with what's called pseudonomus, if you're familiar with that. I just like to tell customers, it's sort of like um, staph infection on steroids. It is nasty. And he was a 150 pound dog, and now he's down to 100 pounds. And um, she said, do you think charcoal will help? And I said, yeah, why don't we try? You know, it's worked with staph infections, everything. Well, anyway, um, she turned the dog over into her name that, um, so if anything happened, she'd be off the hook. And she called in the morning, one morning and said, will you please come? I said, sure. So I took one of um, our employees, we went down there and I told him, you know, they shaved him. And so it'd be easier to apply the charcoal. And we just took an enormous amount of vet detox. We mixed it with olive oil and aloe vera gel. So we mix charcoal, olive vera gel, and then we add the um, olive oil. So it'll keep the um, olive vera gel and the charcoal from drying and it'll keep it moist and make it easier to get off. You could also use coconut shell. Well, this is him and we just covered him as you can see. Now they didn't even know if he was gonna make it through the night because he had totally quit eating. He was becoming very unresponsive. And, but, you know, and so they had a little cell for him but the very next morning, okay, the very next morning, he was hungry and wanted to eat. 
And so they kept taking the charcoal off and reapplying. And um, whenever they would uh, quit with the charcoal, then he'd break out with these hot spots. And so this is what I'm telling them um, and you, if you ever have something, say if it's breast cancer, anything that you're applying charcoal for something extremely serious and you start getting results, okay, you're gonna keep it up for a good three, four weeks after you feel that you are better. And so it can keep drawing. But this is him now. And it all, the whole thing changed him. He actually became a much nicer dog. And uh, he's just a sweetheart. And we got something out of this. Um, so the dog's mom, his, their daughter, her name is Alexis. Yeah, the dog's, oh, okay, so the, anyway, the, guy, the, the woman who owns the dog, her daughter is now working for us. And so they just got so interested in charcoal and she's now working for us. So we're, we're, we realize we're talking to people, but everybody has pets, it seems like, and in some places uh, where we've lived and worked, uh, people depend on their animals. We live in uh, ranch country. And this was a study done in Korea. We've also seen one done in Japan, <clears throat> where these are small domestic farms where they gave uh, charcoal in the feed, very small amounts. Uh, milk cows show that it prevented mastitis, increased milk production, and so forth. Uh, fattening cattle improved, <clears throat> excuse me, meat quality, uh, there was a reduction in bad snow and flies. We sold, uh, I think it was 200 pounds of charcoal. They were using 200 pounds of charcoal a day on a 6,000 head uh, calf ranch just outside of LA, California. And the biggest issue was odor and they were having a very bad PR uh, experience with their neighbors from all this odor because all these calves, a lot of them had scours uh, and they had high disease amongst this, these ca uh, calves. They started feeding them a charcoal every day, and uh, lo and behold, it controlled the scours. The scours then no more odor, no more odor, no more flies, no more flies, less disease. So it was really a win-win for them. Uh, laying chickens and increased egg production. So you can see for people in animal husbandry that charcoal is a real um, potential aid. Here. In, uh, here's a slide that shows a 34 increase in light, 34 percent increase in lifespan. This was done in Russia uh, by giving old uh, laboratory rats charcoal to eat on a daily basis. In fact, another study done in uh, the University of Paris in, in France showed that that they could increase their lifespan up to uh, nine, 90 percent plus. Uh, increase in lifespan and they said that they probably would have lived even longer except they had to sacrifice the animals to finish off their experiments. Um, we have also uh, sold charcoal in large amounts to uh, uh, Monsanto for a plantation that they uh, was poisoned in, in uh, let's see where was it? Yeah, I think it was Hawaii. in Hawaii. Uh, where they poisoned it with a, 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 a DuPont product called Hybar. And so they ordered this, they purchased, I mean. It was tons. I mean, mil just, millions of tons. like a container. Uh, there's millions of tons of, of pounds of charcoal. And within six weeks, they were able to uh, replant their plantations. And here's how charcoal is used for different um, soil contamination. <clears throat> one, one Christmas season, um, we got a call from a frantic uh, greenhouse grower who was the producer for the, the largest number of poinsettias for the Christmas season. And he said that uh, they had inadvertently uh, mixed the wrong dosages for mixtures for their plants and it had over sprayed, over contaminated them with this product. And what could they use? And uh, we overnighted him some um, soil detox which seems to work better for um, soil toxicity. And uh, we saved the, the, we had a part in saving the poinsettia season uh, for that particular Christmas. Yeah, um, they were the ones who supplied <coughs> other nurseries and stuff. They were just huge. We, we did a number of overnights and then started shipping out pallets and they, it, it was saved. I think they only lost about 10% or so. So charcoal is becoming very, very popular in agriculture, in greenhouses, 
And um, that's another whole story here is one of our products was used to help grow giant pumpkins back in 2011. Um, but we're talking about medicinal charcoal from the 21st century. And here's an example of charcoal that's been used in cloth. And here is a Doberman pincher who has a cancer on one of his legs. He's not able to walk because of the pain. And they wrapped it with a non-sterilized uh, charcoal cloth. And they wrapped a wound. And two hours later, the dog was able to stand up and walk around because of the, no pain. And four weeks later, the wound is healed over. Here is a horse with the same uh, wound, another wound that was not able to be stitched because of its, uh, it's just too late. Two weeks later, it's healed over with the same kind of cloth. Here yeah. is a severe pressure sore, day one, and three months later, healed over. And you can find charcoal is actually used uh, regularly in hospitals. It's just that people don't really react, recognize that what it's being used for. We tell people, nurses will say, oh yeah, we use charcoal in the hospital for, you know, overdose and poisoning, but um, they don't realize that it's also used in kidney and liver dialysis units that are used around the world and, and supposedly maintain people's lifespan uh, for years by going in two or three times a week for dialysis treatments. It's in wound dressings, ostomy bags, anemia of cancer, can breast cancer surgery, Crohn's disease, prochitis, renal disease, pruritus, and dental filler, just to name a few. If you go on to charcoalremedies.com, that's the information website, and there's an interesting story. Um, put in Dr. John Clark or put in kidney, and um, his story will pop up how he got um, an elderly man off of, off of kidney dialysis. And he had diabetes. He was a mess and just wanted to die. And a, uh, he was a Seventh Day Adventist, Adventist minister, minister who was, uh, had, uh, had uh, quit working. Yeah. So anyway, um, you read that story. It's very interesting. Got him completely off kidney dialysis. And in fact, a lot of times when people are waiting for a kidney, they will put charcoal poultices over their kidneys um, while they're waiting. But can you even go further? There is, a, there is now a protocol for end-stage kidney failure of just taking charcoal orally. That's a, a country, I think it was Ghana in Africa, that had done a study on that. Uh, poisoning in the home is all too common. And for all the uh, instruction and safeguards, children still get poisoned. And a number of years ago, Kentucky Poison Control Center did a home, in-home use char charcoal for poisoning and they did an advertising blitz, uh, radio, TV, newspaper advertising, trying to get people to stock charcoal in the home. Of 138 cases of home poisoning, 115 were treated at home. The average time for treatment was 38 minutes as opposed to 73 minutes at the ER. Half as many children vomited in the home because of obviously, you know, you go to a, a hospital, it's very strange. It's, is threatening to a little child. Whereas in home, you know, it's so much easier. <clears throat> and not to mention the savings, the uh, Kentucky calculated it was in the millions of dollars of savings that they were able to net by introducing charcoal as a preventive. But it only works if you have it. And it's sort of like a fire extinguisher, you know, every home, Poison control centers have said every home needs to have it. It's not a good time to go buy a fire extinguisher when your place is on fire or sm even smoking. So you might want to make sure that you have uh, charcoal on hand. This is an old slide of mine and it's showing our old label, but um, you need to have charcoal with you uh, for emergency, whether it's for you or your neighbor or some of your work associate, have it on hand. And here's just a short list of a common, very short, very short list of common drugs that are or chemicals that are known to be absorbed very quickly by charcoal. It's actually a growing list of 4,000 plus chemicals, drugs, and toxins. Uh, you can see everything from amphetamine to Valium. Uh, THC uh, was supposedly a recreational drug. We had a young uh, we had a young man call this one time, and he said on the phone. Does charcoal help to neutralize THC? And a moral dilemma, I said, 
yes. He said, thanks, goodbye, click. <laughs> and then sometime later, we had a mother call us frantically saying, my son is OD'd on THC and he's got a, he's got a, a urine test in a half an hour. Will it help? <clears throat> and I was thinking, well, maybe this young man needs some more time to think some quiet time and maybe in a cell. But, you know, God has been very gracious with us, with me specifically, and uh, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And I thought, well, I told the mother, I said, you know, give him lots and lots of charcoal. How much? I, I just said, lots. Give him lots of charcoal. I did not I tell her how much him. because I wanted him to... You know, if he was going to OD on something, it was going to be charcoal. And uh, she calls, I think, a week or two later and said, you, you'll, you'll never believe this, but he, he, tested neg he tested negative on his urine test. And uh, I said, well, that's great. Uh, encourage him to look for something else for recreation. And uh, who knows what the outcome of that story was. But, you know, it's every major hospital in the world, anything, any Western hospital has charcoal on, on hand for all kinds of accidental poisonings, attempted suicide, you name it, anything from DDT and digital, digitalis to, um, oh, it's not on here, but we, uh, we've mentioned uh, uh, radioactive material as well. And that's the point of oh, taking lots. Metals. You know, people always ask, we're so oriented to dosages <clears throat> and such, you know, well, we don't know. Um, just take a lot. When our dog was severely poisoned, I gave her a lot, giving her a third of a cup, and it totally pulled her through. The, the, um, the a third of a cup three times a day. I'm sorry. Uh, the metals in red are actively absorbed by charcoal, depending on the kind of charcoal. And the ones in black, very, very poorly. Uh, you'll see mercury there. Uh, there's all we. There's a lot of mercury poisoning going on. And, uh, and of course, a lot of people know that there's mercury in vaccines. And that's a whole other discussion point of vaccines and charcoal. I don't know that we have time to get to it today. You know, about the mercury, so it's showing that it's poorly and such. But if you go on to charcoaltimes.com, it's our blog, and I'll share it shares my story. It's under charcoal protocol. And so when they're thinking of using the charcoal, they're meaning like getting it out of water or whatever, and it's through a one-pass deal, okay? But charcoal does absorb those that are in red. But so like when it's in your body and it's just sitting there, it's going in your mouth, it's coming out the other end. And so read that story because it does work. It's just that it has to have a more prolonged contact. Contact time is a big thing. And as she said, in air and water filters, it, sometimes it's not the contact time that you would need. Uh, here's a dialysis machine. And uh, one of the things, one of the components in a dialysis machine is charcoal. It's sometimes only to clean the water that's used to clean the blood. But sometimes they have hemoperfusion cartridges attached. Or in the case of liver dialysis machine, the blood is actually, the, the blood is actually milked right over a bed of grain or charcoal. And it keeps, well, for people who are uh, cirrhotic um, or severe hepatitis, that they're, they're no longer functioning mentally, within a short time, uh, they're actually able to communicate again, uh, just because the charcoal kind of relieves the mind of this burden of toxicity. And a lot of people will mention when they start taking charcoal, one of the first things they notice is uh, clearness of mind. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, we live in an environment of toxins, unless you live out here in Northwest Nebraska, where, they, where the deer and the antelope play and the buffalo roam, you might be exposed in a city environment to all kinds of uh, toxicity. And uh, it's used in dialysis machines for that. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a protocol now for stage four kidney disease. Uh, no, but we're talking about activated charcoal this morning mostly, and you cannot make it in your kitchen oven. Here is a a giant uh, oven. It's some of them run from 100 to 200 feet long or 20 feet in diameter. And they cook charcoal, they insert charcoal, and what comes out the other end is activated charcoal. Uh, it's less the old story of less is more. Uh, one, three pounds of charcoal might go in one end and it comes out one pound of activated charcoal, but it still has the same uh, outer dimension 
as far as the particle is concerned. How does it work? Well, you can see in this uh, microscopic picture how many convolutions and how much surface area there is for these tiny, tiny microscopic uh, particles. And when you take one teaspoon of this charcoal powder and you were able to unfold the surface area, it'd be the size of a soccer match, a soccer field. So that's a tremendous amount of surface area. And that's why industry and commerce uses it to remove all kinds of unwanted products. Now, uh, the WHO say that gastrointestinal infections cause 80% of all disease worldwide. That's why charcoal is used in water filters to clean out all kinds of debris, toxin, and so forth. And there's 50,000 deaths a day from this, uh, this worldwide pandemic of dirty water. 9,000 deaths a day from diarrhea and cholera. And I've worked and lived in those countries and people can die in 24 hours from cholera. It's just very, very severe. Once you've had it, you'll realize how quickly I remember how we were in Uganda. And oh man, if I didn't have my charcoal, I mean, it's just in, I'm telling you, in so, very, very short time, what you're passing through is just looks like pure water. So whether it's vomiting, whether it's diarrhea, you know, there's all kinds of diseases that have those symptoms tied to them, whether it's turista, this, tra this uh, traveling uh, disease that a lot of people refer to when they go to Mexico, whether it's cholera, HIV, AIDS, Spanish flu, bird flu, and guess what? Even COVID, Omicron, uh, Delta, they all have uh, diarrhea and vomiting tied to them. We had a call from a guy in uh, Africa who ran a orphanage for HIV children, and he called me out of the blue and said, do you think uh, charcoal would help? And I said, well, I don't think it's going to cure it, but it's definitely going to help with this the diarrhea and vomiting that they have these poor children have to deal with. <clears throat> he called me, I don't know, a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple months later and said, you know, it works. Um, we have to give it to them every day, but it, it's relieved their diarrhea and their fatigue and so forth. And he invited us to Uganda, we went over there and we gave, uh, that was our, one of our first engagements with Africa was because of this young man. And uh, he has so many stories we could, we could sh oh. share it. Um, Colbus monkey is a sp specific band of monkeys in Tanzania. <clears throat> and this particular colony of uh, red Colobus eats charcoal. And uh, let's see if we can make this work here. You know, um, you can get uh, food poisoning anywhere and uh, you don't have to go to Tanzania, but those monkeys uh, actually eat mango leaves and almond leaves, so they're very high in protein, which gives them a, their, their babies a higher body weight, they're more vital, and they have a longer lifespan, less disease, more disease resistant. And so they've learned to eat these mango leaves and almond leaves, but they have a toxin in them that gives them terrible diarrhea. And uh, they've learned to steal man-made charcoal and eat charcoal. And we actually have footage of them fighting over it, uh, uh, charcoal pieces. To, who can get the biggest charcoal piece? Well, Where are they stealing it from? Uh, they steal it from these charcoal vendors in countries where they still cook with charcoal, which is very, very prominent in most countries where we work. Oh. So um, we thought well, how to take charcoal and grind it up. And sanitize it and make it in powder with uh, like in the prison and they can use it um, even if they don't have activated charcoal. Well, we have, it's used in bottled water, aquariums. Uh, How's it used in bottled water? Well, they filter the, the dirty water to make clean water. So all bottled water has gone through a stage of charcoal filters. All your municipal water, everything. Here's the has gone through some form Here's of the Bangor main water wastewater treatment facility where they took raw sewage and they filtered the water 
and they grew a uh, salmon smelt in it to prove that the sewage water was clean when it went back out into the streams and the environment. Uh, when uh, Europeans were coming across the ocean, they would scorch the inside of the barrels to filter water so it didn't go bad. And uh, you know, whether it's the crossing the oceans on planet Earth or crossing the oceans of space, guess what? The International Space Station still requires charcoal to recycle water over and over again because one liter of water costs anywhere from six to ten thousand dollars to blast it into space. So you can't just open a window and throw it away. You have to recycle that water, and I won't go into detail. But um, it's also used in food coloring, uh, and uh, even a Burger King made a, a burger bun with uh, some of our charcoal as uh, so a novelty burger. Uh, here is a white grape juice that started off as red grape juice. It was passed through a charcoal filter. It took out the color molecules. And they were able to sell it as more expensive fine white grape juice. It's used to- And we actually have this on our website if you want to see that it really works. It really works. We have a video showing that. It's uh, used for very fine vegetable oils to take out rancidity bad odor, bad color, bad taste. So you have that beautiful flavor, whether it's uh, an almond oil, almond oil or a, a olive oil or whatever, uh, without all the bad color. It's used to clean drugs, nutraceuticals. It's used to clean the air, nuclear submarines, uh, hybrid cars, the new going thing. They use charcoal to clean the flu, uh, sulfides out of fuel cells. Space suits have charcoal filters in them so they can recycle that air. So it doesn't matter where you go, you need charcoal. And charcoal masks were very popular in 2020, but they go back to World War I and II when they were used to um, filter out uh, chemical gases uh, on the World War I and II, and then the Iran War, they're still used, but what you don't see here is their, their uniforms are actually quilted charcoal fabric. We showed that fabric a little bit earlier on that dog wound. And then here's a mask uh, that we saw that has uh, quilted in charcoal fabric, and it's used in, um, what are these, those uh, suits called? Hazmat suits and uh, nuclear biological warfare uniforms and so forth. You know, we're running out of time here. I'm not sure if you want to go to questions, but we have a lot more on this slide program that maybe we don't have time for. But here's an example out in nature where you have a forest fire. On the left, the picture is a stump that's covered in charcoal, and there's no fungus, no bacteria. It's going to last for hundreds of years, whereas this stump on the right-hand side has been cut down and no charcoal, nothing to protect it from a bacteria and fungus and it will rot before your eyes in a couple of years. So charcoal is antibacterial and antifungal, and it's also antiviral, and that ought to tell you a whole bunch of ways that you can apply it. It was used to preserve dead people, and it would preserve dead mummies. What, just think what it could do for living mummies, and then it works amazingly he's well. A, he's Canadian, so that's what they call mummies. <laughs> mummies. Uh, it's only when ignited and quenched that charcoal itself acquires its characteristic power and only when it seems to have perished that it becomes endowed with greater virtue. And that was uh, the great Roman scientist Pliny back in AD 50. And today it's used in every hospital multiple ways and it's become very faddish. It's used in the beauty sector now. It's picked up on charcoal for improving the skin. Uh, acne and, and so forth. Uh, it's used in all kinds of different cosmetics, face masks. And, and it really works. And it works. We were at a program one time. I was looking at this um, young lady and I just, I just finally said, you have such beautiful skin. And she started laughing. She says, well, you went to set that a few months ago. And she had just, she came to our charcoal program but she knew about charcoal. And so she started using um, a charcoal just directly on her face with a gel. And she did that every single day and it just cleared up all this acne and really her skin was beautiful. Here's, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you can see back in 1813, these, uh, these pharmacists took charcoal and arsenic trioxide enough to kill 150 men. 
and no, not even a tummy ache, you know, because charcoal, they took it before they took the arsenic and they didn't feel sick at all. Here's strychnine a few years later in 1831. Now here's an interesting statement. Charcoal mixed with breadcrumbs or yeast has long been a favorite material for forming poultices among army and Navy surgeons. Did you know that? Long uh, been used. The charcoal poultice has also obtained a high character in hospital practice as an application to sloughing ulcers, gangrenous sores, and recently this substance has afforded immense relief in numerous cases of open cancer by soothing pain, correcting the odor, and facilitating the separation of the morbid structure from the surrounding parts. And that's what you saw in one of those earlier slides where you could see that new skin uh, healing from the outside inward. It is unnecessary to mention other instances of its utility for in this form, charcoal is now admitted into the London Pharmacopeia and it is in general use in all Naval, military and civil hospitals. This was by surgeon James Bird back in 1857, a contemporary with Ellen White. So it had had a long history of use, fell out of use, popularity when drugs sort of took over, but now Charcoal is becoming a very favorite. One of the most beneficial remedies is pulverized charcoal placed in a bag and used in fomentation, hydrotherapy. This is a most successful remedy. If wet in smart weed, for those of you who live in the South, smart weed is also called red bane. It's little, uh, it's a weed that grows ubiquitously everywhere. Little tight budded pink and white flowers. It has a flavor of pepper, pepper, and when you mix it with charcoal, it works really well. I have ordered this in cases where the sick were suffering great pain. And when it has been confided to me by the physician that he thought it was the last before the close of life, then I suggested the charcoal patient slept, the turning point can, and recovery was the result. The body began to heal itself. This is uh, from Ellen White in 1897. Um, just an interesting statement. And I, I want to close the program with this statement. She wrote to John Harvey Kellogg, the director of Battle Creek Hospital. I expect you to laugh at this, but if I could give this remedy some outlandish name that no one knew but myself, it would have greater influence. We, you know, we're, we're taken with sorcery and this enchantment with drugs, but charcoal is so simple. It is so simple that people kind of write it off. How can this thing do all these things from outer space to inner space, nuclear submarines, and more, how can this thing do all these different things? And yet God has placed in our, within our reach a remedy that is both affordable and accessible any place in this world. And um, I have a saying, if you have to be wealthy to be healthy, then God does not love you, does not love poor people. He only loves rich people. But here's a remedy that's affordable no matter where you live in the world. And it works, it works wonderfully. And uh, that brings to conclusion this short version of our program, but I don't know how much time we have left, but if anybody has some questions, we'd be happy to, uh, to share with them. And I just want to say that we have literally, we literally have testimonies of people that were dying and they covered their whole trunk with front and back with the charcoal and pulled through some amazing testimonies. Thank you, Brother John and Sister Kimberly, for this presentation. Um, so much information to kind of orient people if they don't have experience with charcoal, what would they do to learn some of the history behind it and where it's being used in resource poor areas where um, across the globe. So thank you so much. And um, time is short, but we are going to get some questions in. There are a lot of questions in the chat as well. Um, I see two individuals with raised hands, so we'll start with them, and then I'll go to the questions in the chat. Um, iPhone, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you so much for the information. I didn't know so much about um, charcoal, and my question is for someone who is a, who's diabetic and is on medication, how can they take charcoal? They also have hypertension. Uh, yes, they can. Uh, we have a short section in our book uh, about charcoal for diabetics. Uh, certainly works good for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, Kimberly mentioned that earlier for the eyes. 
we had one a customer who contacted us and uh, we noticed he came back and bought a five gallon pail of activated charcoal. So I, I contacted him back and I said, why are, you, why are you buying so much charcoal? And he said, well, I'm a severe diabetic and uh, I read your book and I started using charcoal and uh, I've been diabetic for so long that when the doctors saw my, my blood sugar normalize, they asked what we were doing. And uh, I told them, <clears throat> and so they wanted to do a test with me. And so I bought a bunch of charcoal and they're gonna follow this up for a period of time. And we never did, we never did follow up with him, but evidently with his out of control diabetes, uh, it did help. How it helped exactly, like a lot of things is a good guess. It's a, mis it's a mystery product. In fact, when I first saw charcoal used in uh, Central America, I thought it was black, just another black magic thing. Uh, there was a lot of voodoo uh, where I was living and I thought, oh, you know, but it was a medical doctor using charcoal and he had an arsenal of, of drugs that he could use and he often used charcoal. And, uh, but I never thought about diabetes. Uh, it was a lot of the things that we, we've come to tell people it works for is not be because of personal experience, it's because of all the people that contact us most of them talk to Kimberly when she answers the phone. She'll, they'll relate their stories to her. She relates it to me. And then we put it on a blog and we post it on our website. So as she mentioned earlier, please go to our blog site, charcoaltimes.com or charcoalremedies.com. They're different. They're different. Uh, let me see if I have a picture of our home. Here is uh, our Charcoal Remedies website. And it has all kinds of stories on it um, that you can look at. Here it is when we were in Africa demonstrating charcoal. Here is that brown raccoon spider bite. And Brother John, your screen is just still showing your PowerPoint presentation. Is it not showing the, um, is it showing this, is it showing the website? No, but I did put the link for the website in the chat. Anyway, um, you can go to either one of those. There's all kinds of information for you. Diabetes being one of them, especially people who have these open sores on their body, especially their extremities. And they, you see them one day, they're in the nursing home and they have two legs and two feet and toes. And the next time you visit, there's no toes or there's no foot. And maybe they come back again, there's no leg up to the knee. Charcoal works almost instantly when you put it in a charcoal foot bath. Uh, but as far as regulating the blood sugar, how it works, mystery. I think too, she may oh, okay. be if the charcoal will absorb her medications and most likely it will. And so we don't know how all meds work, but um, so if that is your, you know, that's, that's what you're asking and that's your concern, yes, the charcoal will most likely absorb your medications. And so if you want to use it, you want to just check with your um, doctor or you know who really knows your drug even better is your pharmacist and he can tell you how you can take where you can take your charcoal in a day if that's your goal um, me personally um, i take my charcoal at night and um, you can read about that on the blog i literally take two tablespoons and i swish it in my mouth and i leave it on my um, gums and teeth all night long and i have had um, well, anyway, I went to the, um, a dentist in Denver, um, a teaching dentist. I had uh, some issues. And so anyway, um, he did a full x-ray. I'd never seen him before. And he just sat there looking at my x-rays for quite a while. And then finally, he turned to me and says, wow, you've had some really good dental work done. And I laughed and I said, why do you say that? And he says, because you have had, a, have had numerous um root canals and you have no infection whatsoever and so I was able to share with him it wasn't the good dentist it was actually the charcoal that keeps um, my gums totally infection free right um, again as far as medication in general uh, if you are concerned then give it put yourself a one hour window around your medication when you don't take a charcoal and uh, you should be okay that way um, also, some misinformation on the internet is that charcoal absorbs nutrients, and I don't know who these specialists are, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, they, they claim to be specialists, and they, 
but that's not true. Charcoal does not absorb nutrients. Uh, otherwise, it would not be used in kidney and liver dialysis units and on and on and on. Does somebody else have another question? Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. Thank you. All right, so we're going to end at 10.15 today. Brother Bristol, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Good morning. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath. My question was actually answered to some extent, but I just want to be sure. I normally do mission trips, and you have to be, we have to use malaria tablets every day. How would you advise us to use the charcoal? Because I also use the malaria and the charcoal pills. I heard you said something, you need to space the timing, but could you advise if I'm taking my malaria pills um, around what time I can use charcoal pills? And charcoal pills normally would use like twice a day, morning and evening. I'd like to have some advice. Thank you. Uh, charcoal is, has been shown to be effective in the treatment for cerebral malaria. Uh, as far as a, a treatment, uh, have you heard of artemisia? Uh, new eye, it's, um, it's, uh, it, I think it's milkweed. It was first discovered in China. It works very well for malaria. As far as taking the charcoal, um, we have numerous stories. When I was in uh, Uganda, we were putting on an evangelistic program. The mother came up, and her baby was on quinine, which is typical for malaria. And quinine is just pure poison. There's no other way to describe it. Um, but it is the treatment of choice normally. And uh, I was worried for this mother, and I said, oh, you really don't want to be giving your baby, you don't want to put it on drip, quinine. And uh, she became really worried. And uh, I'd met, I did not mention charcoal for malaria previous to that, but on her own, she went home and mixed up charcoal in a baby bottle. And, or you no, know, she mixed up just plain charcoal, let the charcoal, uh, settle out and then poured the gray water off into a baby bottle and gave that to the baby. And um, I think it was a couple of days later, she came, she came into the group and there was a whole group of women that were outside. And I, I heard somebody start saying, Amina, Amina. And people were almost a little bit Pentecostal and they were all excited. And I, I turned to the interpreter, I said, what is she saying? She said, you know, I started giving charcoal and the baby's no more fever. It, the fever is gone. And uh, it was a very healthy looking baby. Uh, it's, it's, again, the, if you're concerned with the uh, medication, there's two ways of dealing with this. Either give yourself a one to two hour window around your medication or you expose yourself to charcoal bath. And uh, some people take charcoal baths uh, and for all kinds of different issues where they feel that they can't take it orally and it works amazingly well. Uh, the one doctor I worked with, in, he was a medical director in a um, hospital on the Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo border at an Adventist hospital. And he testified that charcoal helped him uh, recover from Ebola. And he said most of, he felt there would have been a lot more recoveries except trying to convince people to take charcoal uh, in Africa is very hard sell because charcoal is sold on the street corners, it's sold everywhere, it's ubiquitous, you know, and the kids and the animals pee on it and they use it to, for cooking. So how do you convince somebody to use that? And so we spent a lot of time there uh, demonstrating how to prepare the charcoal. Uh, it does not have to be activated charcoal. God's arm is not shortened just because you can't get activated charcoal in a nice container here in America. It works. Uh, Brother John, could you speak a little louder? Some people are saying in the chat that the volume is low. Oh, I'll have to get closer. So use it. Um, go on our websites, watch the videos, how to prepare it for poultices, how to make your own charcoal, uh, especially in developing countries where they may not have access to activated charcoal. They should, use, they should know how to use it uh, and uh, distribute it freely. It's cheap. It's inexpensive and it can be made out of coconut shell. It can be made out of hardwood. It can be made out of uh, bamboo. Uh, anything that's available that has uh, is wood based, you can use that. Works great, works great. And the poultices, there's uh, videos showing Kimberly making poultices uh, or, or ch uh, pain patches, all different, all different ways of using the charcoal. 
Can I just like to say here, just for thank you. Thank you. The things that is sold in the store in the U.S. in a bag for charcoal is not what you want to use that has chemicals added to it. Um, we're there talking. Are, there are some charcoals that are, are antidotes, and they used to be mixed with uh, ipecac. Uh, they pretty well got away from mixing charcoal with ipecac because ipecac is uh, causes you to vomit, and that was a strategy for a long time. And then they they dumped ipecac and they were using sorbitol as a sweetener, uh, but you don't really need that. You can use it uh, if that's all you've got, but really it's not necessary. And I think you two, you're, were you meaning like the charcoal that's in bags for cooking with and such like that? Like here in the States, yes, if you've got very little charcoal that's impregnated with a fossil fuel, you definitely need to stay away from yeah, that it, stuff. It's 80% coal. 20% uh, charcoal and uh, lighter fluid. Yeah, that's, that's dangerous that. stuff, yeah. Exactly, thank you. And for, if we found ourselves out in um, the wilderness or in a resource poor area, we could take any one of those substances you named, bar bamboo, a wood, coconut, burn it, and the ashes that are left over is what we could use as a charcoal remedy. It's not activated charcoal, but it still will function and work. A lot of times you'll see that there's been a fire in the woods and you'll be able to find activated charcoal on the trees. Not or, activated, just plain I charcoal. Mean, I'm sorry, I'm still used to saying activated, but you'll find charcoal in the trees. We have pictures of elephants eating charcoal. We have pictures of buffalo out here eating charcoal. And you saw the one picture of uh, monkeys eating charcoal. And it didn't take them millions and millions of years of evolution to learn to eat charcoal for a bad stomach. And uh, we have a, a friend of ours, she works in emergency room hospitals all over the world. And they were out camping and their little boy got a bee sting on his ear. And uh, she was frantic, wanted to get to the nearest emergency room because he was worried he was gonna have anaphylactic reaction. And her husband said, it's all right, sweetie. He went over to the campfire, brought out some charcoal, mashed it up, spit on it. Or I don't know if he spit on it like Jesus would have, but. He mixed it with some water and he put it on his ear. And a couple minutes later, Josh stopped screaming. What so works that fast? Amen. Let's go back to the um, raised hands. Rosemary, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Sister Rosemary, are you there? Okay, hand is down. Oh, sorry. I already, uh, sorry. No problem. Sister Flavia, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, I have a condition of a, a hypothyroid, hypothyroidism, and I'm on medication. So um, does it, um, do you think charcoal would help? Like if I take charcoal, maybe I would eventually get off the medication or is it safe to take it together? I, I can't see you having any complications. Um, uh, low thyroid, it would not be something that I would think of treating it with. Uh, and yet, uh, we, I, we know, we knew one story of the woman who had, well, we, yeah, she mentioned goiter. Charcoal was used for goiter for a long time and they use it with uh, kelp and which is high in iodine, but they carbonized the kelp into a powder and they took it that way. But I, it does come to my mind was a story we had an experience with, uh, we were putting on a program at this, in this church gymnasium and uh, this a, a busload of Amish people came to our program. And uh, this woman came up in the intermission and said, can I give my story? And I said, well, what's up on because I was a little nervous and she said, well, I have extremely high uh, blood pressure. And I could tell that she was probably low thyroid just from her, her motions and such. And I, I said, well, reluctantly, I said, okay, because I don't never believe charcoal would help with high, uh, with, um, high blood pressure. She said, she got up in front of everybody and said, you know, uh, I have high blood pressure. I had high blood pressure. It was 220 over 180. And I was very fragile and very sick. And 
And I, I thought, I guess so. And she started taking charcoal baths and her blood pressure in a short while came down to, I think it was 180 over 120. And everybody was so unbelieved, but couldn't believe her story. Well, as it would happen, a few months later, we saw it in another program and she came up and said, Brother Johnny, you won't believe what just happened. And I said, what? She said, you know, the other day I was feeling so poorly and I decided to take a hot, a warm charcoal bath. And that's what she was doing. She said, I got in the bath and I use it to relax myself. And uh, she said, I got up in the middle of the night. I said, turned to my husband in bed. I said, you get me to a hospital now. I'm very sick. And uh, she went to the hospital. You know what her problem was? She was, her blood pressure had dropped to 120 over 80. She had never experienced, it had been so many years since she'd experienced normal blood pressure that she felt sick. And so when people ask me a question like hydro, uh, hypothyroidism or something, and I don't really have a good answer for that, Kimberly's answer is, how is it gonna hurt you? <laughs> try it, at least try. And, yes, uh, but I always tell people that we're not doctors and, no. um, you know, so you can just take what we say as a grain of salt and, um, yeah. Well, Jesus reached down and took dirt, mixed it with some spit, some hydrotherapy, mm -hmm. and, uh, a poultice, and applied it to a blind man's eyes and he came seeing. Mm -hmm. And he had to go wash his eyes with more hydrotherapy treatment. And hydrotherapy would be probably my choice of treatment for uh, low, uh, low uh, thyroid. But there is, um, if you go into charcoal remedies, there is a story there. And um, we just have a gal right now with a goiter and such. And if anything, you can just you know, wrap your neck with a um, charcoal poultice mm -hmm. if you want to stay away from taking it internally, because internally it will most likely absorb meds. Okay. Thank you. So we oh, must so remember that we first ascertain the cause. So like um, brother and sister, uh, brother John and sister Kimberly are sharing, um, taking it ex using it externally will be um, good as well as talking with a medical missionary where you are or connecting with one and speaking with your healthcare provider and getting an education on what is the cause of your hypothyroidism and going to work um, backwards from there. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Um, we're gonna have to have you back <laughs> because we have run out of time. There are still questions in the chat. Can we take one more before we close? Sure. Sister Marilyn, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. And this will be the last question before we close today. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thanks a lot to the presenters. Now, I sent a, a, a link, a, a photo to someone on WhatsApp, and then the person called me back and thanked me and said, because they um, went to, they did blood works, and it showed that their kidney, some levels, I don't know what it is, was up. So they, they were thankful for it. So I, as he talked about that, I want to know if you go to the doctor and you have some kidney levels that are up, I don't know what the <coughs> levels, what he's talking about, what can you do? Well, um, drink lots of water. Uh, that's the first thing I would suggest. Drink lots of water because your kidneys need water. And mm -hmm. most, most Americans are chronically dehydrated and borderline constipated. So the water is a number one treatment and then your kidney needs some help in cleaning the body so if you're going to take a if, you, if you're going to on a be on a dialysis machine which supplements the work of the kidney uh, and it has charcoal in it then it makes good sense that you can apply charcoal orally or topically as well so i'm not sure if i'm getting to, to your question or not but um do some research. Uh, come on to our websites and read the many testimonies and stories and the different ways of using it. We have the, the stories are they're really amazing. So, excuse me. We're so oriented to putting something in our mouth, okay? But charcoal can literally pull toxins from deep tissue. So applying it topically is absolutely.
absolutely amazing. Yeah. So whenever you're concerned, you know, about taking it internally, and which we didn't mention because we didn't have time, but it does cause constipation and there's a way around that. But putting it over your kidneys, kidneys. every single night, you know. That was the first real uh, time I saw the effect of some charcoal. Uh, a doctor, we were treating a, a, a liver cancer patient. He was terminal. And the doctor said, I want you to put charcoal poultices over the kidneys at night. And I use a white paper towel, put the charcoal on, or was it cloth? I can't remember. But it was white. And in the morning, when I pulled that poultice off, it had the, the white part had turned yellow, a bright yellow, and, this, and the poultice reeked of urine. And I was blown away to, see, to say the least. I could not believe that that poultice could have done that. But this has been known excuse me, in the medical literature for years that charcoal has this ability. So yeah, kidneys, liver, stomach, uterus, uh, your toenails, ingrown toenails to, uh, we can't get into uh, brain cancer, but you know, there's, these are not our stories. These are other people's stories, including doctors. And there are a lot of progressive minded doctors today who are willing to experiment outside the box. And we are we are so thankful for these healthcare professionals who we've used a lot of their stories and a lot of their information on our website and in our book uh, to show that yes, the whole spectrum from from the common person who knows very little about health to healthcare professionals who use charcoal on a regular basis. And you know what else can you use besides bread to 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 make the poultice? Well, flaxseed, a uh, psyllium seed husk powder. Uh, we've used, we've seen cornstarch, corn flour, flour. I've it's seen good. peanut butter by a Loma Linda doctor who had nothing else to mix it with peanut butter. I thought that was a, uh, that was a shame to waste peanut butter. But anyway, he used it on a diaper rash for his baby. But it's on our website how to make a poultice. Very simple. Ground flaxseed is probably the easiest thing to use and you're making a paste, I like to use aloe vera gel. Yes, you can use oats, oat flour, oatmeal, uh, anything that will hold the moisture a little bit longer. So by itself, charcoal powder dries out very quickly and it loses its effectiveness. So what we're, the strategy is to try and keep it moist longer as possible. Charcoal does work dry, but it, um, when it's moist, when it's wet, it works it's, yeah, it has more drying power. Amen. And thank you for sharing thank the principles behind adding. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. With this, we're going to come to a close. We'd like to thank you uh, both, Brother John and Sister Kimberly, for waking up so early in your time zone to be with us today and for just this educational, educational um, experience. I've put in the chat all of the links to their website where um, there's much more information on, because we're not able to get to all of the questions today. So um, thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you next week, same time. We went uh, over today. However, um, thank you for your patience with going over time. <laughs> so highly valuable. Um, Brother Chris, are you there? Can you close us out with a word of prayer today? Uh, he's not there. I will close us with the word of prayer. Silent prayer, I guess. God hears. And uh, his name be praised. Amen. All right. I didn't realize I was on mute. <laughs> but I think we got, uh, let me finish the prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, thank you for this time with the Dimsleys and all of the learning. Lord, may we apply it to our lives.
ourselves and the lives of others as we put into practice your health reform message. Please be with each and every one on this call as we continue in our Sabbath day or begin the next week. This is our prayer, Lord, and we pray for, for continue forgiveness of our sins that we will glorify you in our walk. This is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you.